Thanks, uh, Mehmet. And uh, lest you think that uh, Affinity and uh, Advocates for Dignity aren't really on top of the news, you might check your uh, iPhones if you've got a news website to see the BBC um, carrying a story that's saying the EU is now to give migrants uh, fleeing Turkey and uh, finding refuge on Greek islands um, 2,000 euro if they'll go home. <laughs> More easily said than done, I suggest. 2,000 euro may not be much help if the first place you end up when you go home is a prison cell. Um, but it adds to the weight of, uh, of what we're uh, experiencing with this exhibition. It couldn't be more prescient that we have an exhibition of photos such as these, which in some way, I think, encapsulate much of what Hizmet is about. Here you have an exhibition of photographs that start with concern for ordinary people in a desperate situation on that border between Turkey and Greece and expand out from a story about Hizmet and members of Hizmet who are suffering there to a story about the world. That is, because all men are brothers. And this is a story about the brotherhood of humanity, or the brotherhood and sisterhood of humanity. So it's a great pleasure to have on an appropriate evening such as this, um, the Professor of Visual Arts from St John's University in New York, Professor Alex Morell. Now let me tell you a little bit about Alex. Uh, Alex, it's a very interesting background to actually be a professor of visual arts who is actually a practitioner of visual arts. So often you hear about academics and people want to say, yeah, practice what you preach or even learn to practice. Here is a practitioner who has become an academic and is now sharing that with others. More than that, he's sharing a vision of humanity. His photographic work addresses topics ranging from the deeply personal to the socially concerned. And there is an overarching commitment to photography as a tool for social transformation. He has worked in Haiti, in Turkey, and more recently in Brazil and other places around the world, seeking to examine people's relationship to environments as affected and defined by the changes we're going through in this rapidly transforming world. Would you please welcome the Professor of Visual Arts from St John's University, New York, Professor Alex Morrill. Alex. Thank you very much for um, the invitation. Um, let me first thank um, uh, the Affinity Foundation, uh, Advocates for Dignity, and all of you here for sharing this night with me for the invitation. Uh, uh, it's a great honor, very humbling for, for me to be here with you and uh, be able to um, uh, share with you my work. Uh, um, uh, basically, that's what the work is for. Um, so I hope I, I don't disappoint too much. Uh, it's, it's a little overwhelming maybe to hear so many times repeated Professor Alex Morell, the, uh, the academic or something like that, because the truth is that I'm a photographer. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm an artist. Uh, first and foremost, uh, that's what I see. There was a little picture. Ah, oh, there it goes. <laughs> that's me. T-shirt, little camera with me, um, trying to meet people. Uh, uh, trying to learn about others, um, finding myself in situations that I think are important or interesting. Um, the whole um, uh, teaching part, at some point, that was someone's idea that maybe I should be in a, in a classroom like teaching and somehow I ended up there. Uh, and lectures actually make me a little uh, probably uncomfortable just because I know that I can put people to sleep <laughs> being on a podium here. so. Um, if this was my regular classroom, I would uh, get off from the microphone and I would probably sit among all of you having a conversation out loud uh, and uh, um, trying to throw questions out there and create a conversation, uh, much more comfortable. So because of that, I actually um, wrote down a few words to make sure that I don't um, 
uh, run into tangents, as I'm already doing, maybe, um, and get to some um, basic ideas that I, I would like to get across. And uh, uh, of course, uh, very happy to, uh, uh, to engage in a conversation afterwards uh, and answer questions and talk. OK. Um, like I said, I'm not really a good speaker. I'm an image maker. And as an image maker, it has served me better to listen rather than to talk too much. If I have something to say tonight, it is for the most part already expressed on those photographs that you see out there. I mean, those are, to me, my words. Some years ago, I met a few uh, people who caused a great impression on me for many reasons, but I'll mention some simple ones. First, their incredible sense of civic responsibility and service to the communities in which they live. Second, their appreciation and commitment to education as a constructive uh, social tool. Third, because they were caring mothers and fathers and sons and daughters who honor their parents and families who opened their doors and shared their food with neighbors and with strangers like myself at one point. They all do this in the belief that hope in a, the hope in our own personal efforts could lead to building a much better and peaceful society. As simple as that. So I'm sure that you can see how attractive people like this could be. So I set out to meet more of them, uh, to listen and to make images in the hope of understanding them better. And today I can say that like those uh, first few impressive people that I met some years ago, I have come to know many incredible women, children and men, whose attitudes and efforts fill me with great hope today. That is his met. During the past few years, I have uh, been working on a visual documentation of the Hizmet movement, also known as the Gulen movement, in an effort to um, understand what this movement is, what it does, its motivations, its impact, no longer in its native Turkey, where it came up, um, but as the international movement that it has become, movement that is has, his, uh, uh, has had its impact and effect in over 160, 70 countries around the world. Some of you might know this movement well. Others might know very little about it. But a great majority out there do not know anything about Hizmet, and I sincerely uh, uh, think that they all should. So far in my process, I have seen the work of tireless and committed individuals who truly believe that selflessness service towards others, education as a foundation, and respect for our differences can really bring about peace and prosperity in our societies. I have also witnessed how those individuals, because of their ideals, are being persecuted, jailed, tortured, and wrongfully accused of plotting against democracy of everything. Early in 2018, I visited Greece, attracted by a wave of new uh, uh, of refugees that few have heard about. These were not the refugees escaping conflict in the Middle East uh, or the, the ones journeying uh, from Africa in search of more or a better economic future. Um, hundreds of families, thousands of people, women and children, have been forced to leave their country, Turkey to escape the current government's uh, persecution. Exhibited tonight is a small selection of this photographic project. The exhibition Beyond the Water are portraits and stories of Yumit and Sevinc. Those are two Turkish names that I've chosen and rebaptized the Catholic in me in a way. Uh, all the Turkish men and women that I have met uh, during this time in order to protect their identities um, as their situation uh, was and continues to be very delicate. Yumid is a male name that means hope. Savinj, a female name that means happiness. And to me, when I learned about the meaning of those uh, names, uh, they felt perfect for the experience that I had had meeting all the people uh, that I met and the families in, uh, in Turkey. 
in, not in Turkey, I'm sorry, in, uh, in, in Greece. So from a statement about this work, uh, let me read. The past few years, a silent and terrifying exodus has been taking place in Turkey. The Turkish government's violence, persecution of anyone associated or sympathetic to the Hizmet movement has for hundred, forced hundreds of families to flee the country and risk their life trying to cross the border or the sea towards uh, the safe heaven in Europe. Hizmet, a civic movement whose effort has been concentrated in peace building through education, dialogue and relief efforts, has become the scapegoat for President Erdogan's, Erdogan's regime. Thousands, including teachers, judges, lawyers, and women with, uh, with their children, have lost their job, been jailed and tortured, accused of taking part in the failed coup attempt of uh, two, uh, July 15 of 2016. Beyond the water are images and accounts of people that have crossed the Ebros, uh, also the Merrick uh, River, or the Aegean Sea, in fear, leaving behind everything except hope. Those stories, the stories of those uh, families are unique, but also very uh, similar at the same time. Their personal tragedies are unique and living nightmares, without a doubt. The accusations against them couldn't, however, be seen more baffling. Among some of the most common reasons to be blacklisted and persecuted are teaching or studying at a school inspired by Hizmet, Using the popular messaging app called ByteLock, something very similar to what we know as WhatsApp. Having an account in the well-known, very well-known bank, Asia. Or subscribing to what at the time was the largest, most important newspaper in Turkey, the Saman. I think of like the New York Times or the Washington Post back in the United States. So just a subscription to that newspaper could um, uh, um, be reason enough for you to be apprehended. Across those cold waters, the Everest and the Aegean Sea, they found, to their surprise, the open arms of neighbors, the welcoming smiles of soldiers, believe it or not, that they once thought that were enemies, and the nurturing care of school teachers. It seems, after all, that their deeds and beliefs arrived before they did. I invite you, of course, to spend some time throughout the evening uh, with a few of these images and some of the brief um, accounts and, uh, of individuals and families uh, who escaped the Persian Turkey into um, uh, an uncertainly life as, uh, as refugees. Um, I know that maybe we'll talk about that, but uh, if I may, um, I, I can tell you a little bit about a particular story that is very close to, to my heart. It was the very first family that, uh, that I met um, on the very first day that I got to, uh, to uh, Greece. Uh, and those pictures, I'm trying to see, uh, maybe not here, might be outside. Um, there's a photograph out there of a man holding a newborn baby with a mother right next to them. That picture was taken at a hospital. Um, this, um, this family, I'll call them Umid and Savinj. Um, yes, yes, that image. There's Umid, Savinj, the mother, and a new baby born. Uh, they left uh, Turkey uh, because of the threats that they were receiving and the possibility of being jailed. He lost his job. He was a manager at a manufacturing um, um, uh, company that made parts uh, for agricultural instruments. Maybe some 150 employees there. Uh, she was a teacher. Um, and uh, they sold everything that they had. Um, in uh, how, as fast as they could. I mean, you know, even even selling uh, your properties and your things to, to, to amass as much asset as possible became very problematic and difficult because nobody wanted to like be uh, associated. Um, but um, uh, she was seven months pregnant when they decided to leave. Uh, plus they had uh, two young children, um, uh, Edip and uh, Nese. Um, Edip was only um, a little over a year, uh, and uh, for 
two and a half days, they walked and slept in the woods, you know, close to the borders. Uh, they were smuggled across by um, uh, smugglers uh, that charged them uh, close to 10,000, the equivalent to close to 10,000 US dollars, probably most of everything that they had available. Um, and uh, soon after they made it to, uh, to the Greek side, they headed to the hospital immediately. Um, she was going into labor. Uh, not knowing the language, as um, uh, Mehmed uh, was talking about before, the experience of many people, not knowing the language, not knowing how to communicate and seek help, they got to the hospital trying to seek help um, uh, uh, for Savinch. And uh, it was, if it wasn't for uh, a Greek lady that just happened to be there that day. She was maybe going to see someone else or for her own uh, checkup or something like that. And, uh, and she knew uh, Turkish. She was able to communicate with them and she told them, it's like, um, do you need help? Um, what's going on? And uh, they explained to her. Um, and she, uh, uh, she stayed with them and, and she helped them manage the whole system and get to the doctor. Uh, Savinch gave birth that day. Uh, the name of that lady is Irene. She stayed with them that day. She came back the next day to see them. She came back the day after. And ever since she stayed with them and she became like the godmother for the family. They named the baby after her in honor of her. So the name of the baby is Betul Irene. A name that uh, coincidentally also, um, I mean very appropriately, means uh, peace. Uh, so this whole story became very, you know, to me very, um, uh, aside from important, very meaningful because uh, here we're talking about how uh, a Greek national uh, helping refugees uh, uh, coming, uh, not only helping, just giving herself completely in, in as much as she, uh, as she could to help uh, uh, a Turkish family. People that grew up uh, seeing the other across the border as, as enemies, usually tensions. Uh, I mean, I'm not an expert in uh, Greek and Turkish uh, history, but um, um, uh, uh, there's always been some tension and uh, some way of looking at those uh, across that, uh, that border. So you wouldn't expect that uh, these were the people that were going to help you, right? And this story is not, it's not unique, right? It's uh, um, many situations like that continue to happen. Uh, um, soldiers that, uh, you know, one of the things that, uh, here, Yam, I'm trying not to go on tangents, bear with me. Um, one of the things that, that started happening early on is that uh, uh, the Turkish families and people, they would cross the, the river, they would uh, cross the sea, and they would go immediately to the police station. They wouldn't try to hide among the population and make their way somewhere. No, no, no. They would, they would go straight to the, to the authorities and present themselves and tell them who they were, right? Um, interestingly, they would know who they were. I mean, yes, you're from Turkey. We know Erdogan. We don't like him, right? And uh, we know who you are, right? So, okay, so, you know, th there were families that spent a few weeks, maybe at the beginning, in the camps, but the authorities would realize right away, well, you know, like, this group is very different from the other ones. You know, the way that they're behaving, um, the way that they keeping, you know, so organized in this corner and things like that, they're actually, you know, affecting how the other ones are also behaving within that group and stuff. Um, so soon enough, um, um, they were allowed to continue on. So they would, you know, all the refugees afterwards started arriving and maybe spend a day or two paperwork. And then, yes, you can move on and, uh, and go into uh, some of the cities and establish yourself a, a little bit better. Um, so um, uh, it was very impressive to, to, to notice, to realize uh, that uh, this kind of um, uh, uh, relationships between both Turks and, uh, and Greeks um, were taking place. Um, I don't know if I have um, uh, time for something else, or should we continue on? Yeah. Okay, so um, I would like to, um, I have a letter 
um, that I received from uh, um, one person, I'll call him Yumit also, Yumit K, person that I met in Greece. Uh, he wrote a letter to the Turkish, uh, um, I'm sorry, to the Greek authorities um, uh, as part of his plea for asylum, uh, official asylum and recognition uh, um, while he was there. He had been there over a year when I met him and his, uh, uh, his situation was, uh, was still not, not formalized as a, ref uh, as a formal refugee yet. Uh, in the meantime, he was very far from his family, his uh, son. So he sent me this letter and uh, uh, I cannot think uh, any other reason why except that, uh, you know, to share it with whoever I can, whenever I can. So I, I thought um, that maybe it was appropriate for me to like, you know, read some of it to you. Um, so it goes, um, Sir, Madam, I am Yumid K, and a citizen of the Republic of Turkey. I am an elementar elementary teacher and the husband of Sevinj K, who is living as a conventional refugee in Canada. I am the father of Berin K, who has had to leave away from me, her father, for a year and has been recently leaving also as a refugee, as a conventional refugee in Canada. For three years, I have been living in the most dreadful conditions I could never desire and imagine. I was detained for three times for being a member of the Gulen movement. I was once jailed, I was exposed to violence and pressure, and I was threatened and tortured in both detention and prison. With my lawyer's objection and a court decision, I was released. However, my life after prison was never the same as before. I had had a respected status in the community, but through the misperception by others, I lost my respected status. I was fired from my work. Finally, I had to flee my own country with the hope of beginning a new life and to reunite with my family. I arrived in Rhodes, a Greek island, on the 22nd of August of 2016 with two friends in a boat. When we arrived in the island, I called my wife. I wanted to let her know that we would leave on good times, on good days again. However, the victimization did not leave me. I went on to the police station. I told them that I had to leave Turkey in a boat as I had a ban on international travel and arrived in Greece without permission. I told them that my wife and daughter were, leaving, were waiting for me in the US and I had a valid visa. When they checked my passport, they found that it, had, that it was declared lost or stolen in the Interpol system by the Turkish government. And they told me that I was not allowed to travel with it. I had to apply for asylum, not to let them, not to let them return me to Turkey. I was detained for 111 days, along with drug dealers, murderers, rapists, rapists, uh, thieves, and all types of basic criminals for smuggling into a country and leaving and having an invalid passport in such a way that a political asylum seeker should never um, deserve. After the police threatened us with lawfully keeping us in jail for 18 months and upon the psychological problems that we suffer, my friend Halil, who's now in Canada, tried to commit suicide two times. In order to convince him out of suicide and to obtain our freedom, we decided to go on hunger strike. On the sixth day of hunger strike, the chief of police came to promise that we would be released if we ceased the strike. We were released after two weeks on December 12 of 2016. During those painful and poisonous 111 days, we call them 111 years, for which I still weep on remembering, I suffer abominable pains. However, beyond all sufferings and all the pains I experience, a voice I heard on the phone that will echo on my ears forever hurt me so much that left me and left me wounded. That voice said, Dad, can we be a family again? On those most painful days, I was shocked by such words from my daughter. In fact, my daughter was expressing her own pain. The phone just slid from my hands. I just collapsed like a building in a severe earthquake. 
For about 500 days, I have been away from my daughter, my daylight, and my wife I greatly miss, and all those I love. 500 days and nights filled with agony and fear, tears, I'm sorry. The destiny crucifying Jesus crucified me in Greece. In Greece. I cannot be saved. Days do not flow as rivers. Each day I am stabbed at new on my chest. My family was made to live, uh, this family was made to live together, not to be separated. I must tell you something secret. I never had a girlfriend and I never asked anyone to be one. I had to love just one woman and I had to be hers with my flesh, blood, soul, dreams, and my past, namely as a whole, and I had to belong to her. One day, I met a girl as clever as, as Athena and as innocent as Maria, and we got married. When I held my wife's hand, we promised each other that those hands would never separate until death put us apart. However, they got separated. For 500 days, those hands cannot meet I am very lonely. Loneliness sounds like death to me. I am really depressed. My wife and my daughter also get depressed each day. Last week, my daughter had a breakdown and told her mother that she wanted to stab herself with a bread knife. My wife cannot shoulder the burden. When I think about what we are going through, I cannot breathe and my heart misses a beat. I know that it is, not, it is not the ocean that separates us, but procedures and laws. Soulless laws that are as cold as a gravestone and as cruel as a henchman's knife. Gandhi said that laws did not have to hurt men's dignity. If they hurt, they are not laws but fists. We are entirely broken. Our days are full of fears and nights are scary too. At the end of November, Erdogan will visit Thessalonique and probably bargain for the return or kidnapping of Turks as he happened in Pakistan, Malaysia, Kazakhstan, and a few other countries. Maybe I will never be able to see my daughter and my wife again. Please help us prevent unstoppable disaster from falling upon us. That was his letter. Thank you very much.